Good morning. Welcome everyone to another edition of Ask the SCSA. My name is Joanne Davis and I'm a safety advisor from the Regina office. So before we get started, I just want to share an event we have coming up later today. Okay, so the event that we have coming today is our Saskatchewan NAOSH and Mental Health Week virtual celebration. Can you guys all see the poster? Okay, and that is going to be today at 12 to 1.30. And we have a guest speaker, uh, Rihanna Bolshi from the Canadian Mental Health Saskatoon branch, speaking on coping in times of change. Uh, we also have a few other speakers and I'll get to them on the next page here. This is gonna be held on Zoom and streamed on Facebook Live as well. And I will be posting the link to that in a moment in the group chat. So our agenda for that celebration is going to be um, welcome from Saskatoon RSC Chair and Event Moderator Bob Watson from PCL Construction. We're going to have the Honorable Don Morgan, Ministry of Labor, Relationship and Workplace Safety, as well as Colin Poulard from the, the President of Saskatchewan Construction Safety Association. Gord Dobrowski, the Chair of WCB Saskatchewan and WorkSafe Saskatchewan will also be attending, as well as I said, our guest speaker, Rihanna Boshi from the Canadian Mental Health Saskatoon branch with her presentation. And again, uh, we'll have Mayor Charles Clark from the city of Saskatoon. And then we'll have a period of questions and comments at the end. So I hope you can join us and I will be sending that link shortly. Give me a moment to stop sharing. Okay, here we go. Um, so now let's introduce, we'll go around and have everyone introduce themselves who was on the panel today. Um, Lori, would you like to start first? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lori Sins, Program Administrator out of the Regina office, and our department covers CORE, CCORE, NCSO, and HSA. I'm Sandy Zerowski. I'm a safety advisor in the Regina office and I've been there since last September. Thanks everybody for watching. Hey, I'm Justin Brooks, uh, safety advisor here with the SCSA. Hi guys. I'm Jason Clapper. I'm a okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jaria Samrath. I'm a safety trainer out of the Saskatoon office. I've been with the SCSA now just a little bit over a year. Hey, welcome to all, all our panelists. So uh, we're going to go through a couple things first. We will have a question and answer section at the end of our presentation please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. This is also being recorded and available on Facebook Live and will be available for later viewing as well. So we are gonna start off with our presentation on PPE and Sunday is gonna be presenting that for you today. <laughs> Actually, that's Justin. <laughs> okay. Hey. Thanks. Justin, Justin will be presenting his presentation on PPE. Thank you so much. That's okay. I almost got out of it there for a second by default. Mental Health Week. <laughs> All right. Let me just uh, bring this up and then I'll share my screen. Uh, as soon as I remember how to do that here. Thank you for putting that presentation together, Justin. That I've had a preview of it and it. It, it's very good. It's very detailed on PPE. Okay, no problem. Um, there we go. I think we're good now. Hey, everybody can see that. Yes. All right. So this is a presentation we put together um, 
when things kind of go back to normal, this is a great presentation to have the advisors come in and we'll actually go through this information and do the demos. Um, if this is something you want to save, uh, you can use it to help with the training for your employees uh, for basic uh, personal protective equipment. So we'll kind of go through this and we'll touch on a few different pieces of equipment and on the use care and limitation. So it's titled personal protective equipment, the last line of defense. So as we go through, why isn't this? All right, why isn't this working for me here? All right, let's try this again. This is not switching. Technical difficulties, one second here. Why isn't this? Oh, okay. There we go, that's odd. It's not switching. All right, cool. All right, this might be a little shaky. So, so in your manual, you should have some instruction on how to use and fit PPE. This is an example of a respirator procedure. Uh, this can be found on the manufacturer's website or in the user guide when you buy the product. This is why it's so important to keep and uh, to, this is why it's so important to review and keep manufacturer's instructions. So this will come with all pieces of personal protective equipment. All right, so when we go through section 87 of the regulations, um, this talks about summary of offense tickets, so SOTs. These are issued by OHS to employers and in some cases workers for not following legislation. So in section 871A, the employer contractor shall supply approved personal protective equipment to the workers at no cost to the workers. So just some information for yourself, this ticket is a thousand bucks. 871B states that employers are to ensure that PPE is used by the workers. Uh, this ticket is also a thousand bucks. In 87.4, workers who are provided with PPE are required to use it and take reasonable steps to prevent damage to it. Uh, we're going to talk about today about preventing damage to your personal protective equipment. This is a ticket that can be issued to workers for 250 bucks. So keep in mind that 87.5 also states that workers must return defective personal protective equipment. So not wearing PPE that an employer provided because it was damaged is never an excuse. So first one we're gonna talk about here is protective headwear. So when we talk about uh, classes of headwear, a class C hard hat provides no dielectric protection. So there are two standards that a hard hat are made to. This is CSA, Canadian Standards Association, and ANSI, American National Standards Institute. They both use the same system. This, uh, the classes divides a hard hat into groups by their dielectric properties, which is their ability to conduct electricity. We move into a class E hard hat. The class E hard hat provides dielectric protection up to 20,000 volts. This is the highest dielectric protection available for a hard hat. All classes of hard hats provide the same protection from objects falling on your head. Then we go into a class G hard hat. The class G hard hat provides dielectric protection up to 2,200 volts. Uh, at a high voltage, it will conduct electricity. A class E hard hat may become a class G hard hat if a lamp, bracket, or post for hearing protection are added to the hat as you have changed the dielectric protection. So as you, you know, drill more holes into the hat from the manufacturer um, to add things in, you're just uh, reducing its amount of dielectric protection. So your hard hat will also have a type, a type one hard hat, provides protection if the object falls directly on top of your head. So this is the one that you're seeing right now. Um, this is the most standard uh, hard hat you're gonna find on site. Then we move into a type two hard hat. A type two hard hat provides protection if the object falls directly on top and if the object hits the side of your head. You can have a class E type one or type two hard hat. So be specific in your policy as to which one the workers will need. This one, um, you're going to see more uh, in, say, things like the logging industry, or sometimes uh, it's in the policy for some people that work around cranes or things that have uh, low swinging objects. So the label on your hard hat, your hard hat needs a label or an imprint on this, of this information on it. 
if the label is missing, you'd have to get a new hat. Uh, we, we often get asked what happens if the sticker falls off? Well, I just said it, you know, you'll need to make sure that you get a new hard hat as a CSA approval um, is not indicated. Unless of course, you know, this information is imprinted on the hard hat itself. So this symbol you've sometimes seen imprinted on the sticker. This is the reverse donning symbol, which means the hard hat meets the standard if it's worn forwards or backwards, as long as the suspension system is rotated. So you don't want your ratchet on the front of your face. Uh, unless your company states otherwise, the hard hat can be backwards to facilitate a face shield or a welding helmet. Uh, it's best practice to leave it forward though, as the brim of the hard hat helps to deflect material from your face. So this little symbol on here is the date that the hard hat was molded. So we often get asked when does a hard hat expire? So this is not only up to company policy, but more importantly, manufacturer's recommendations. So don't go by this date as the manu uh, you know, because this is the manufacturer's date. So the replacement date should be from the date it's put in use. Um, so you will have to keep track of when you put your hard hat in use. So the middle number there that you'll see is the year and then it's pointing to the month. All right, so we often get uh, see this on site. Uh, people often like to store items in between their hard hat and the suspension system. Although it's convenient, it's a terrible idea and not the manufacturer's intended use of this space. The clearance between your suspension system and hard hat must be maintained uh, to provide the uh, proper use of your hard hat uh, while you're wearing it. So if you're if you're wearing like a hat or something like that, um, this is not what you want um, because it could end up uh, in your skull if something was to fall on your head. We definitely don't want that. So we get asked if this if it's okay to wear you know a hat or a toque under your hard hat. The short answer is no. Um, you know, especially again like with a, a baseball cap with the metal button on top an object were to fall on top of your head, that metal button would be driven into your head. Um, wearing things like hoods, uh, you know, those uh, stop your peripheral vision and uh, things, certain uh, things like that button, that metal button could uh, diminish the dielectric properties of your hard hat. So instead you can use manufacturer approved liners. Um, these are things that you might want to include in your company's personal protective equipment policy. So inspecting your hard hat is not just a visual process. One thing you'll want to do is compress the shell inward from the sides about an inch, so around 2.5 centimeters with both hands, and then release the pressure without dropping the shell. Shell should quickly return to its original shape, exhibiting elasticity. Sunlight can cause significant damage to your hard hat as well. Um, so if the sample does not exhibit elasticity similar to that of a new shell, replace it. You want to make sure that you're inspecting the shell for damage, cracks, abrasion, or excessive wear. Obviously, these are very extreme, but uh, in any case, you want to make sure that you're inspecting for those. You want to make sure you inspect the suspension straps for cuts, frays, chemical damage. <clears throat> make sure that the ratchet system opens and closes fully, and that suspension slots tie into the hard hat fully and flush. So a big question we get often is, can you put stickers on your hard hat? Uh, yes, pressure sensitive non-metallic stickers or tape are okay to put on hard hats. The stickers should not be within half inch of the edge of the hard hat. If they are closer, this could affect dielectric properties of the hard hat. Some people ask why not uh, the metallic stickers and the metallic stickers again can change the dielectric properties. With the stickers on the outside, you're still able to check the inside for any damages, uh, any hairline cracks or anything, um, but it's just very important that you're able to inspect that hard hat. If you do cover both sides of the hard hat, then the inspection, uh, you're not able to conduct that inspection. So when it comes to hard hat maintenance and care, uh, clean the hard hat shell and suspension system with a mild detergent and hot water. Uh, this is really good information to have during an orientation is to just make sure your hard hat is clear. This stops the growth of, you know, things like bacteria, keeps the hard hat clean and makes it easier to do the inspection. All right, so we are going to move on to eye protection. 
So the Canadian National Institute for the Blind states 700 Canadian workers per day sustain eye injuries on the job. In Canada, eyewear will have a Z94.3, the CSA logo, and in the States, they'll have the ANSI Z87. In Canada, in order to meet the standard, the glasses must pass the CSA impact test. To pass the test, it must withstand an impact of a 6.4 millimeter steel ball traveling at a speed of 46.5 meters a second or 102.9 miles per hour. Uh, CSA Z94 divides eye protection into six classes. Some classes have different levels. So this table uh, from the standard outlines the hazards that are best controlled by each class. Looking at the hazard exposure to dust and wind, the table recommends glasses, goggles, non-rigid hoods, and face shields. So the company safe job procedures and practices may narrow it down from this list. The CE logo, uh, it's, a, it's a mark certifying that indicates a product's conformity with the health, safety, environmental protection standards for products sold within the European economic area. We often hear the question if uh, a pair of sunglasses with this logo, like, you know, they may have this logo on their sunglasses, are they CSA approved? And the answer is that uh, on sunglasses, this just means that they meet UV requirements and not that they're safety glasses, right? So when determining for your safety glasses, again, you want to see that uh, CSA or ANSI Z87 or Z94.3. So both clear and colored lenses can be CSA or ANSI approved. In fact, safety glasses have a wide variety of styles and colors to choose from. However, you may decide uh, to include in your policy that tinted glasses are for outdoor use only. You may want your policy to state that you require the foam insert type of protective eyewear. Many companies are switching to these due to their ability to provide protection against wind-driven dust and debris. If you wear prescription glasses, you may have CSA or ANSI approved eyewear. Otherwise, you must wear the over the glasses type of safety glasses. Uh, your policy may state that side shields on prescription eyewear is required. Face shields are another means of eye protection. You may want to include in your policy that eyewear be worn with face shields. This could also be outlined in your safe job procedure. Section 145, grinding machines, states eye or face protector, and section 93.1 states eye or face protectors as well. So this is a big one, uh, care and maintenance of safety glasses. We get asked the question how often companies should be cleaning safety glasses. Um, the best way to do it is with lens cleaning solution. I know a lot of people don't carry that on. Um, the problem with using things like Dawn uh, is that could remove an anti-fog coating. So when cleaning your eye protection, remember uh, to use a lens cleaner or just warm water. Uh, clean the sides and earpieces. Avoid abrasive cleaners or rough cloths. Inspect daily for cracks, broken arms, damaged nose pieces, and store in a hard case if you can or a microfiber pouch to prevent damage. The problem with using your shirt to just clean your glasses is now you've just basically turned your shirt into a piece of sandpaper and you're going to scratch the glasses and ruin the coatings. All right, so we will move on to hand protection. So according to Saskatchewan Workers' Compensation Board, claims made in 2017, hand injuries accounted for nearly 30% of all injuries in the construction industry. So you're gonna notice a few things uh, on this glove. The first being the ratings. Now let's see if I can get this to work. So, perfect. Outlined in the red, the four numbers are abrasion, cut, tear, and puncture. So those are those four numbers uh, just located underneath the shield there. A uh, good way to remember this is just the acronym ACT-P, Abrasion, Cut, Tear, Puncture. So outlined in yellow, we have the grams rating. Uh, sorry, let me just get rid of something here. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. 
Uh, we'll have more on this in a second. Uh, the gloves pictured have the old rating and the new rating to the right of them. The rating is a level two, which is 500 to 999 grams. The gloves pictured are rated for light cut hazards. This has become kind of a, an area of, of a lot of confusion because there are, is a lot going on on gloves nowadays with the introduction of the new system. So we are gonna talk more on that here in a second. So the A1 to A9 system for cut resistance in grams is a much more accurate way to decide on what level of protection you'll need against the hazards you'll face on the job. So you can see here that that A1 is 200 grams or less. This is just for material handling, small parts assembly, sharp edges, packing, warehouse, general purpose, forestry, construction. So anywhere where you're gonna see uh, some very light cut hazards. Whereas you roll up to the A9, this is a really heavy duty glove for metal stampling, metal recycling, pulp and paper. Um, so just changing aids and things like that. Uh, you might even run into these with food prep and processing, meat processing. Generally speaking, on a construction site, you're gonna see anything from an A3, maybe an A6, but this all really depends on the hazards. Uh, you can't just take that as a general, general statement. This is just what we see most often on site. So this is where I said things kind of get a little confusing because this is where we start mixing the old ratings, which I showed you before, which was that ACT P. Uh, those four numbers under the shield. With the EN388 ratings, these are from the European standards. So th this rating system allows for more accurate testing uh, of higher rated gloves. So when we start getting into those, uh, those A1 through 9, this allows uh, us to get a much more accurate reading to separate those categories. So again, we'll kind of go through this in the beginning because it does mix the old then with the new. So under number one, that abrasion resistance. So the material is subjected to abrasion by a sandpaper under a determined pressure. Protection level is indicated on a scale of one to four, depending on the number of turns required until a hole appears in the material. The higher the number is, the better the resistance to abrasion. So the cut resistance, so this is known as a coupe test. This was the original test that uh, has been determining the strength of gloves for a long time. So the cut protection is tested, a knife is passed over the glove material until it cuts through. The protection level is given by a number of one through five, where five indicates the highest cut protection. This test is known as the coupe test. So um, this has been used for a, a long time, like I had said earlier. Now we go into the tearing strength. So this for, a force is required to tear the glove, material part is measured. The protection is indicated by a number one to four, where four indicates the strongest material. Then we move on to the puncture test. So based on the amount of force required to puncture the material with a tip, so it's basically a, like a nail. Uh, the protection function is indicated again by a number between one and four, where a four indicates the strongest material. Now we get into the next test. So this is the cut resistance TDM test, uh, also known as the uh, ISO test. So, uh, the result of this test is given by a letter A to F, where F indicates the highest level of protection. If any of these letters is given, uh, this met method determines a protection level instead of the coup test. So this will be the major determining factor in uh, determining the level of cut resistance. And this, when this is done, this is done with a new blade every time, whereas the coup test uh, originally used the same blade for all the testing. The new test uses a brand new blade every time it's, it's tested. So it's a lot more accurate when it comes to those higher level of gloves. And then we have the impact protection, which is the last uh, one there. So if the glove has an impact protection, the information is given uh, by the letter P. If the test is not performed on any one of these, it will be replaced with an X. So sometimes companies choose to do the uh, TDM test or the ISO test instead of the coop test. So where the coop test, instead of displaying a two or a five or anything like that, it'll just have an X and then they'll have a rating on the cut resistance uh, TDM test. I hope that kind of explained things and using that A1 to A9, that's going to determine uh, uh, as well as the level of uh, cut resistance that they have. So 
All right. So when it comes to choosing a glove, it's important to remember that no single glove will provide protection in all applications or against every hazardous substance. During the glove selection process, identify key elements that are required to perform the job safely. Are there chemical hazards present? Are abrasions and punctures from sharp objects a problem? Is a secure grip vital to the application? Is dexterity important? Pictured here are six different styles of gloves that offer six different levels of hazards from different paths. So we have electrical insulating, general purpose leather, cut resistance, heat resistance, cold resistance, chemical resistance. So it's really important that you determine what the hazard is before you determine the glove you need, and then you can uh, figure out what level of protection you need after that. So it's kind of a one glove does not fit every application. When it comes to care and use, work gloves should fit comfortably and never be too tight or too loose. The material must be appropriate for the type of work performed and should stand up to the tasks involved. Workers should have all the relevant information pertaining to their gloves, including whether or not they're reusable. Never wash or reuse disposable gloves. That's more important now than ever. Keep gloves clean and dry. Store gloves in appropriate conditions for their use. For example, rubber insulated gloves should be stored in a cool, dark area that's far away from any heat or steam. Nothing should be placed on top of gloves as it might distort their shape. Make sure backup pairs are available in case gloves get damaged or need to be washed or dried. Check for holes, tears, cracks, discoloration, stiffness, or other damage, signs of damage before each use. Visual inspection might be enough in some cases, but depending on the type of glove, a more thorough inspection can be for, performed. So for some gloves, like maybe Petroflex gloves or something, they like to fill them with water to ensure that there's no pinholes. Make sure they're replaced uh, if they're damaged and wash gloves in a mild detergent, warm water, let them dry. A lot of times people will, uh, it's always a good idea, you know, turn them inside out for a little while and then turn them the right side in and let them continue to let them dry. All right, so moving on to hearing protection. So there are many types of hearing protection and they all have different ratings. So keep in mind in section 99.2 of the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations, uh, it states that we have to wear hearing protection when noise level is greater than 85 decibels. Hearing protection reduces the decibels to a safe level, but it does not reduce the decibels to a level of zero. So keep in mind that that 85 decibels is a magic number where you need hearing protection. So this gets, uh, this gets a lot of attention and we have a lot of questions on this sometimes. So, Hearing protection uses a scale to rate them. It's called the NRR, noise reduction rating. The NRR is the number of decibels that the sound will be reduced by using this device. So here are some samples of noise reduction ratings for ear uh, plugs and ear muffs. Each manufacturer is different. So we get asked what happens if you wear them together, right? So uh, logically we would assume that we, if we use both, we would get 32 plus 25. So we would have 57 decibels of, of protection since we're using both of them together. So what actually happens according to OSHA is that adding five uh, decibel rating to the product with the highest NRR gives you the new noise reduction rating. So using the two items above, the combined NRR would be 32 plus five equals 37 decibels of noise reduction rating. So I hope that kind of clears things up for a lot of people. So here's a table to show various noises and how long it takes for hearing damage to occur. So as you can see, we often underestimate the decibel level of some noises we come into contact on a daily or weekly basis, right? So even things like mowing your lawn, if you're mowing your, your lawn once a week, that has an, uh, an NRR, or sorry, a decibel rating of uh, 91 decibels, right? So. so if we wanted to operate a chainsaw, it has a noise level of 115 decibels when running. So if you use some roll up earplugs with an NR of 25 decibels, the new decibel level for you is 90 decibels. So at 115 decibels, the operating time is 30 seconds. By using the earplugs, the decibel level has been lowered to 90, which means we can now operate for two hours. And again, if we use some secondary protection, we can add five, which will you know, bring us down a little bit more. So that may give us a little bit more time. So again, when it comes to the ratings, if we look at those yellow lines, we can see the effectiveness of hearing protection in the lab. As you can see, the hearing protection devices provide some pretty good protection. We also have to remember this is a lab setting, which is controlled by experts. 
plugs were inserted into the ear canal correctly and everything was monitored during the testing. So if we look at the gray lines, we can see that this is what it's more reflective of the real world. The effectiveness of hearing protection is way lower than in the lab setting. This is because people don't wear hearing protection properly most times. Um, this could be for a lot of reasons, whether it's laziness, maybe lack of education. Uh, people just don't know what it feels like to have an earplug set in properly. Um, they're in a rush, complacency, whatever the case is, this graph shows the importance of proper education and proper fit and how uh, installation of the earplugs is super vital. So when it comes to inserting earplugs, uh, somewhere in your policy or training, you should have some proper installation instructions. So make sure your workers are informed and are wearing hearing protection properly. Hearing protection is, if it, uh, is not effective if it's not used correctly. It's just like any other piece of personal protective equipment. Here's one that's really, really important as well, is to remember to discard single-use earplugs when you're done. Wash uh, multiple-use earplugs in, uh, or earmuffs in uh, mild soap and warm water and inspect for any damage like rips and tears. I know I worked on a job site years ago where people were reusing the disposable ones that are attached to the cord. They attach them to the back of the helmet, use them for weeks. We had an outbreak of ear infections. Uh, we traced it back to people reusing earplugs. So it's very important to make sure you have a lot of these on site. And if you're using multiple use ones to make sure that they're washed uh, as much as you can. You know, it's good to make sure you're washing them daily or frequently during the day, every time you take them out if possible. All right, so protective footwear. So the CSA standard on footwear has many different classifications. The green triangle, uh, indicates that the boot has a grade one protective toe and puncture resistant sole. The triangle has nothing to do with the height of the boot. Uh, as an important note, the triangle actually only appears on the right boot. And if you don't believe me, go take a look. Not right now, after the webinar, we'll go check. Believe it or not, the CSA approved sandals with the green triangle exist. So when you're creating your PPE policy, make sure to be specific when it comes to footwear. Specify height, laces or no laces, green triangle, etc. Um, so, for example, all employees are required to wear lace-up, 8-inch tall, green triangle, CSA-approved boots. Be specific on the type of boot, too. Uh, if you want boots with ankle support, write it out. CSA-approved cowboy boots also exist. One thing that comes up often in our classrooms and on site is if employers are required to provide boots like they have to provide eye protection, for example. The short answer is that the only time an employer is to supply protective footwear is when the worker's feet may be endangered by hot, corrosive, or toxic substances. So there are other CSA designations for toe and sole protection. The yellow triangle indicates grade two and sole protection. The blue triangle indicate, indicates grade one toe and no sole protection. There are multiple CSA standards, so you must spe be specific when creating your policy. The CSA also has secondary symbols. So the orange Greek letter omega indicates electric shock protection. This protection is weakened as you walk through mud and water. The yellow SD tag indicates static dissipative footwear. Static protection for those that work in computer server rooms, uh, for example. The black M indicates metatarsal protection, which is the top of the foot. And the green evergreen indicates chainsaw protection. So the classification be added together like uh, in a boot, which is grade one sole protection, dielectric shock protection, and metatarsal protection. If this is something that you want, specify it in your policy. Make sure people know before they're, uh, before they're hired on during the orientation that you require a specific boot because you've identified such hazards required on your job sites or for your company. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't switch over here. So that's what it would look like. All right, so it's important to inspect your protective footwear before you put it on. Check for an exposed toe cap, cracked leather, excessive wear or damage, soles, uh, broken laces, or anything else that may affect the protection of the wearer's feet. So you want to make sure that you do a thorough inspection. We see a lot of times people with exposed toe caps. Uh, you can get toe cap covers that can fix that up provided they're uh, installed correctly. Um, but you really want to make sure that you're, you're doing a once over on your boots, uh, especially daily. 
I know people do it a lot of times when they work in the roofing industry uh, so that they don't damage membranes. They have to check over the soles of their boots often, but they often neglect the rest of the boots. So it's really important that you're doing a thorough inspection of your, of your boots and stick to your policy and manufacturer's recommendations. All right, so try and keep your footwear clean, which can be difficult uh, given the time of season. Mud and moisture will reduce the electric shock resistance of the footwear. So to use a leather protective coating will extend the life of your boots. This will reduce the dielectric properties, but so will mud and moisture. And for those that work with concrete, I've done it a lot. Uh, concrete will destroy your boots. Uh, so it's very important that you have separate rubber boots for dealing with concrete that uh, meet all the CSA standards. And don't walk through concrete in your boots. It will destroy them. All right. So that is everything. I appreciate uh, the time to go through this with everybody. Stop sharing now. Okay, thank you, Justin. That was great. There's a lot of great information on PPE and that's really important to our industry and construction. Uh, we use our basic PPE on a daily basis and it's really good that we have the proper education and information. So now we're going to move into our Q&A uh, segment and we do have a few questions that have come in and a lot of them uh, do have to do with PPE. So I will um, get those answered. Let's see. One of them is about fit testing. Is it hard to get fit testing booked? Can I use a manufacturer's specs to train my guys? So this is a two part question. Uh, one about um, how hard it is to get fit testing and the other is would you use manufacturer, manufacturer's specs when training? Would anybody like to answer that? Um, I can take a stab at that. For you. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what's available in Regina right now for or anywhere for that matter with the six foot um, distancing rule. Um, I have heard uh, there are a few places doing fit testing. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder that fit testing needs to be uh, done by a competent person. If you look in the OHS regulations, um, 88 1 uh, A, it states where a tight fit is essential to ensure a worker is not exposed to one or more airborne contaminants to an extent that may pose a risk of significant harm to the worker. Um, it, it has been fit tested by a competent person in an approved matter. So no, somebody just worker training a worker on fit testing, I would not recommend that. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Yeah, definitely you're gonna have to check around for where you can get your fit testing done. Um, different places may be coming available as Saskatchewan reopens. So you're gonna have to look for that. And definitely use manufacturer specs when you are training them on PPE. Take that those specs out, go over them with your with your employees, and make sure they understand because different PPE might have some different specifications in use. So that's very important. Thank you. Next question: I have guys in the crew that are constantly losing their safety glasses. Do I have to keep supplying them new ones? Oh yes. Yes, you do. Um, however, having said that, though, um, it's very important that, you know, as an as a employer and supervisor, you're ensuring that your workers are safe and that they're provided with personal protective equipment. But again, like we had stated in the, uh, in the presentation, that the workers, you know, they have to wear the PPE as well. So this is a, a good spot to really have that conversation with the workers that, you know, this stuff costs money. It's not for free, uh, even though it doesn't cost you guys any money. I have to make sure that you're wearing it. So this may be a spot where you may need to uh, enforce uh, your disciplinary policy with workers to ensure that they're taking care of, of the personal protective equipment that you're providing them with. A great comment about the disciplinary policy, Justin. Um, I have actually heard um, on a bonus side, companies that will reward their employees $20 a month in a, in a voucher for keeping that same pair of, of glasses. 
and not going through a pile of them. So a reward system based uh, than a, a disciplinary policy. So there's, there's ways around it. Okay, thank you. I have another one here on, uh, this one's on hard hats. Can I use a marker to write, put in new state inside the hard hat uh, to show when it was put in use and is it good enough proof for expiry? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to use anything. Uh, the problem is with hard hats is you don't want to compromise the shell whatsoever. So to pay, you know, it really depends on what type of marker. I think the easiest way to do it is to put an approved sticker on the outside or inside of the hard hat. Uh, and then you can write on that sticker. Um, and it's probably best, you know, on a little spot on the inside. Um, another way to, that, uh, uh, you could uh, do it is you could just log, keep a separate log of the hard hat that was given. So if a hard hat was given to me, you'd have my name, you know, in an Excel spreadsheet or whatever that Justin was given his hard hat on this date. And then, you know, the Excel, Excel sheet could uh, populate when it's starting to get close to that expiring and such, right? So there's, there's different ways to do it. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't expose your hard hat to chemicals as much as possible. Because, I mean, sometimes it already happens on the job site. And if you can stop that from happening, when you're writing on it, it's even better. Okay, thank you, Justin. I have a question here for training. Uh, when going online and registering for training, I still see that there's classroom training on the schedule. Uh, are those gonna be opening up? We are currently doing the scheduling uh, on a week by week basis, or sorry, two week by two week basis. So those are just staying up until we kind of progressively go through this as we can kind of on a week by week basis. So that's why they're remaining right now. Um, and as the weeks go by, they will be doing that on a week by week basis. Okay, thank you, Jaria. Yes, we do have training that is now being done virtually, uh, instructor led training uh, coming out all the time. So that's exciting to get our members that necessary training for the programs. Speaking of programs, I do have one here uh, concerning audits. Do auditors pay particular attention to individual pieces of PPE during their audits? Thanks, Joanne. Thanks for the question. Yes, they do. Uh, the audit is a complex uh, tool that is used by the SCSA. And we have prior to look at, make sure companies follow. We also have to look at the liabilities. And of course, the integrity core. Yes, we do pay attention to the types of. Look at uh, <clears throat> practices and procedures. And is the employee. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, you were breaking up a little bit there, but just to um, uh, go over that again, that the auditors are looking at PPE. They are looking at your procedures and practices and what PPE is required and that making sure that you have the training for that as well. So yes, they are definitely paying attention to your PPE. Okay. Uh, one question about the uh, summary offense ticket that we mentioned in our presentation. Can you appeal it? Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody that receives an SOT will have their, like any other ticket, they'll have their uh, opportunity to appeal it in court. Short version. Thank you. And I guess another one on the same lines, what should I do if my employer refuses to supply me with PPE? You can exercise your right to refuse. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, it's an, uh, employers, employers have to provide you, uh, with PP, they have to ensure that you are protected, right? So if an employer is refusing, so hypothetically, if you were told to go up onto a roof, uh, and you didn't have fall protection training or a harness or lanyard or something that didn't fit you properly, um, you would be able to exercise your right to refuse. Every worker has that right. Those summary offense tickets 
Joanne. Um, we actually have a, a toolbox talk on the SCSA's website. Um, you can download that and feel free to, to review it with your crews. Um, failing to supply approved personal protective equipment can result under those summary offense tickets uh, $1,000 to the employers uh, or contractors. Um, there's all the fines are listed there as to who, who would have to pay how much. So it's a great toolbox talk. Have a look at it. We'll post, try and post the link here. Yeah, yes, we do have a lot of resources available online and that is one of them on the summary offense tickets. I do have one here. Um, are you accepting any paperwork to be dropped off at the office? I know that our offices are closed, Regina, we do have somebody answering the phones and somebody there sometimes. Um, they're asking if there's a drop off slot. If we want to hand in paper copy, do we have anything in place? I'll help you out with that one. Um, could be a wide variety of items that they're speaking of dropping off. Um, we, we can accept things electronically. That is the number one option at this point. If uh, that is not possible, they could uh, make arrangements to drop something off at the Regina office. Um, once they arrive there, they would have to call the office number. It's on the window. Uh, then someone would let them leave it at the front table there. We have a drop off area then we'd have to go through that process of having that sit there for three or four days before anyone's going to uh, look at that or process it any further. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Lori. I guess this would pertain, I guess, if there was a manual or maybe some other documentation proficiencies and so forth. Um, obviously, we do want um, digital copy uh, would be the safest way for everybody. And we do have a procedure in Regina to accept some uh, documentation as well. Thank you. I have a, I'm going to go back to PPE here. I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, we have some of the guys do not like the safety glass style. They don't like a specific style. Is it the obligation of the employer to supply a different style? And that they are also, sometimes the workers uh, may complain that they're fogging up. Um, do you have any recommendations to help with that? Okay, Justin. Yeah, yeah, it kind of depends um, on what they're saying about style. Like if it's just a, a kind of a, uh, they want a different fashion statement, um, the, the employer has done their due diligence to providing them with safety glasses. However, I've had safety glasses one pair to the next um, where you put them on and you get these like pressure headaches and it hurts behind your ears. They don't fit you properly don't fit your face properly. If that's an issue, that's something that can be worked out with the employer to maybe uh, look into getting you a different style of glasses um, because they have to fit. They, you know, they have to be somewhat comfortable. Um, you have to be able to wear them all day. And, and I'm sure any employer, employer genuinely wants their employees to be able to wear them all day. So uh, having said that though, if it's just something where, you know, hey, I really want the Harley Davidson ones. Um, yeah, you got to go and buy them yourself. As far as the fogging up thing, uh, being a carpenter myself for a lot of years, I've noticed this a lot, with, especially when you're moving from inside to outside. They haven't totally perfected the anti-fog lenses uh, to the point where it works every time. However, there are some really good ones out there. The, the whole thing with the anti-fog is to have the moisture actually just beat up. Um, there will always be that moisture that's there from going to you know, hot to cold or if you're working on the cold and you're, and you're working really hard and your face heats up. It's just something that happens. Uh, I had purchased a product years ago. It was called cat crap and it's like, it's blue and it looks like it's in a little lip chap thing. And you spread that over your glasses and, and it worked really, really well. You put on the inside of your glasses, when they fog up, everything beads up so you can still see through your glasses. Um, and then when you have an opportunity, you can wipe them clean and apply more. Uh, but I mean, the reality is, is that this is just something that will forever be an issue until they really really figure this whole anti-fog thing out. Unless anybody has seen anything different or come into contact with anything different. And if they have, let me know. But you still have to wear your safety glasses when there's danger to the eye and especially if, you know, site policy dictates that as well. Yes, thank you. Great information. Um, we definitely need to wear our safety glasses regardless of fogging up. Just take the opportunity to clean them when needed so you can see properly as well. I do have a programs question here. How much notice do I need to give to book an audit? 
uh, I guess my external audit's coming up, I'm not due to the fall. So how much notice, how far ahead should we be calling to book in audits? We got whether C core or core. If someone's not due to the fall, uh, we do have a process in place at all times, and we're still doing this, is sending out reminder packages to the company. So once you get that reminder package, that's kind of your signal to fill out that paperwork, submit it back, and we'll get a date organized with the company. Thank you, Lori. And I do have one. Is there a way to receive notifications and emails regarding new online training when it becomes available? Uh, do we have a system in place to send notifications out, Jaria? Currently not. We do highly recommend and suggest that you visit us online at scsaonline.ca. Uh, the updates are constantly happening. Our training coordinator does an extraordinary job of ensuring that those courses are constantly uploaded and the new ones that we're um, providing pretty much on a daily basis are being updated, including the limited availability. So um, check as frequently as you can for the courses that you're interested in and ensure that that registration happens as soon as possible. But for now it is just visiting online. Unfortunately, we don't have the abilities to email everybody on the basis that these new items are coming out. Thank you, Jaria. Yes, we do have the, the new courses again, uh, being instructor led virtually coming out. Uh, this again is a new process. And so some of the classes will be limited in uh, availability and uh, class size as well. I do have another one. I need WMIS uh, or BTT for um, my program uh, in CSO. Um, when do you know if these will be converted to online? Are they on the schedule to be? There is definitely a plan to get those online. They haven't been worked on or solidified yet, but definitely keep up with us and we'll make sure to update that as soon as we can. Again, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're working, the team is working hard in getting these uh, courses available to our members that are working through their, whether it be CORE, uh, C-CORE, uh, NCSO, and HSA. I do have another uh, PPE question. With COVID precautions in place and limiting the spread of viruses, does this change how PPE should be cleaned? Uh, is there anything in place for soft surfaces like a gloves, boots, harnesses? Um, anybody want to comment on that one? Thank you, Justin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so it's always great. We, and we kind of talked about this in a, in a previous webinar as well, uh, about having places for employees to wash their PPE that are separate from other employees. So whether that means, and I'm sure everybody's seen them now, the hand washing stations, uh, that are available in grocery stores. You can you can get these delivered to you on site, provided you can find someone that has them. Uh, workers can wash their PPE that way. Uh, if you have if you do have the ability to have running water, um, because you know you, you want to make sure that we're stopping the transfer of these things. Another thing is is that generally speaking, harnesses will be uh, given to an employee to wear. Um, it's it's fairly rare. It does happen. It's fairly rare that people, you know, just grab any old harness uh, and go to work, you know, because it takes time to fit that to their body. So it's generally faster that each employee has their own harness. They can maybe uh, work something out with the employer to just keep these in their car um, so that they're not, you know, sitting in the trailer and then they can wash them. You know, you just, again, same thing, some mild detergent, wash them in water, uh, rinse them off in the, uh, in the tub and then hang them over you know your railing on the front doorstep kind of thing let them air dry so it, it's really important to just keep all that washing sep as separate as possible i've also Thank heard you, justin um Go ahead. lockers lockers being utilized um companies certain companies out there are making their crews lock, lock lockers so they can individually store their their personal items and stuff so it's all separated just another great idea of how they're working to to go forward with this. Yes, thank you, Cindy. Very good uh, add on point to um, the PPE and keeping it clean for our workers and having those processes in place. I have a question here when it comes to uh, HSA, Health and Safety Administrator. What, is a pro what process do I have to go through to receive my HSA? Uh, I don't have any work experience uh, in the field, uh, but I'm interested in this program. Mm -hmm. Yes, HSA would be perfect for that uh, person. No experience is required for that program. It is an application process and then taking our courses, 
Um, and that, that's about it. <laughs> so it's a pretty simple process, uh, easy to register, no experience necessary. Thank you, uh, Lori. Again, this information is available on our website. We do have a lot of resources there. Uh, probably just ask her a couple more questions. I do have another one for our auditor, Jason. Again, it's with PPE and exactly what are you looking for on the job site? I know we mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, is there anything particular to pay close attention when it comes to PPE on the job site, when it comes to audits? Yes, the best advice I can give to you is read your company's and procedures and PPE you should be wearing for the task that you're performing. Then check to see that that's what's being done, that the appropriate PPE is being worn. Thank you. Again, yeah, we want to make sure that you're wearing the appropriate PPE for the task you're doing and following those procedures on the job site. So we got a couple minutes left. Um, one here, once I register, how soon do I receive confirmation that I am booked? Uh, does this confirmation come with instruction for signing in? So once registered, I guess I'm going to say this is a training question. Once I register for a class, do I receive confirmation? Uh, Jaria, do you have some insight on that one? Um, yeah, so once you register for the class, it's obviously quite immediate that you know that you are a part of that classroom, but the day before the class is set to happen, you will receive an email from whichever trainer is holding that class with further instruction on how to sign in and what to do um, in a very easy step-by-step -step basis. We are required to get the proper email, though, that you're expected to um, look at so that you can get this um, information. We've had a few people send us their work email, but then be at home and only have their access to their personal email. So just ensure you're providing us with the proper email and we'll be sure to send you all of the appropriate information. There's technical support available prior to, and it's included in the emails as well. So you can contact our uh, training support team and we'll ensure that you're logged in and ready for the course when it starts. Thanks, Daria. I do have one again for programs. Um, someone, a company said they're all ready for their C-Core baseline audit before COVID-19 uh, um, came upon us and we had to shut things down. They're asking, is there anything they can do now? They were ready for it. Uh, what is the process now? I'll take that. Yes, if they're ready to book, um, they would have been given some audit paperwork to fill out when their manual was reviewed and approved. Um, if they need that again, they can reach out to us. We can provide that audit paperwork. They fill it out, return it back to me. We'll schedule a date for you because we, we are doing remote CCOR audits at this point. So what that involves is um, giving the company access to a secure FTP, FTP site, and then they'll upload uh, documentation to that so that we can perform um, the remote audit. So SQL audits are documentation only, so we can still do those at this point. Uh, Jason, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Okay. I'll just give the email if, uh, if they need to reach out to us for that audit paperwork. It's STSA program info at scsaonline.ca. Okay, thank you everyone. That brings us to our time. Again, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, please register for our uh, event today, our celebration, NAOSH Mental Health Week event uh, at noon. That's going to be on Facebook Live as well. So that is going to be uh, exciting to join. And I didn't get to all the questions today, but we will be back on Tuesday. And again, our website does have a lot of resources. You may be able to find some of the answers there. So thank you and uh, maybe see you later and next week.